Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I am Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. On today's pod, we are going to say the words soft landing so many times they will lose all meaning. And I'm going to reveal the single biggest differentiator between happy and unhappy people. Then Amazon is trying to freshen up its grocery business by making its stores a little less soulless. Plus, if it feels like it's been tough to fill your prescriptions lately, you're not alone. There is a massive Adderall shortage going on right now that just won't go away. It's Thursday, August 3rd. Let's ride. All right, Neil. So on yesterday's show, we kind of offhandedly mentioned this idea of a Morning Brew Daily Book Club. And holy moly, the people loved it. We got tons of emails, tons of YouTube comments and some tweets even or whatever you want to call them these days. So are we doing this thing, Neil? Well, I don't want to overpromise and under deliver, but I think that this seems like a good idea. I mean, we like to read, uh, you know, just like five pages before we go to bed every night. Uh, so I, it would be really fun to do a book club with everyone. I was thinking of a particular book we could start off with. Michael Lewis is coming out with his big SBF book in the fall. I, Maybe we could get him to uh, get him on the phone and talk to him, uh, do a little interview, and I'll read that because. He randomly embedded with SBF right when the whole FDX thing collapsed. So this is going to be like the most anticipated book of the year, at least in the business circle. I love Michael Lewis books, too. What's your favorite? I've read Big Short, Blind Side, uh, Moneyball. I've done the greatest hits for sure. So Michael Lewis, if you're listening, yeah, jump on. I mean, Moneyball was literally, it changed an entire industry. Absolutely. I mean, I guess we'll put out a call, though, too. We don't want to just monopolize the book choice. So if you do have an idea for a book, shoot us an email at morningbrew.com. Oh, really? I was going to pull pull a dictatorship. Hey, I mean, we can do it. We can do it, Neil. We can do whatever we want. (laughs) All right. To start things off today, I want to play a little how it started, how it's going. So here's how it started last year. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon warned of a hurricane about to hit the U.S. economy, and Bloomberg's economic models predicted a 100% chance of a recession within the next year. How's it going? Yesterday, Bank of America became the first major bank to backpedal on its prediction of a recession, saying that the most likely outcome for the U.S. economy is a soft landing. Just for a quick refresher, because we're going to be saying soft landing a lot, that is just economic speak for the Fed bringing inflation back to normal through interest rates without sending the economy into reverse. Bank of America's backpedaling comes one week after the Fed's economists also did a U-turn. They said they didn't see the U.S. economy entering recession as they predicted previously. So with inflation on its way down and growth still flowing, a rising tide of economists do not expect what has been called the most anticipated recession in American history to ever materialize. I know. And one of my favorite kind of litmus tests of where people are at in terms of like uh, approaching the soft landing is how many times it's mentioned on earnings calls and the phrase soft landing was mentioned 97 percent more this cycle than the last one so this earnings cycle than the previous one so clearly companies are also looking at this and i think it's like one of those things where you don't want to jinx it so they didn't say it a ton last quarter but then this time around they're like okay we feel a little more confident about it so yeah they were saying 97 percent more uh soft landings made it out in their right a few of those was the pnc ceo is a huge bank he goes i think the soft fan the soft landing feels right. Uh, The Wells Fargo CEO said the economy continues to perform better than many expected. Chipotle CEO, who's got, you know, his eye right on the ball with how people are spending, said we're not seeing any weakness, especially in the lower income consumer who might pull back in the, you know, in the face of a recession. If anything, they've continued to improve. So you're saying you're seeing CEOs all over the spectrum in a wide variety of industries saying people are still spending. And the big reason why uh, there's this big Wall Street Journal about like what what is why are we having a soft landing like what is the underlying mm-hmm. factors and it's because companies just aren't laying off that many people or that many or anybody at all and people are still getting their paychecks so like the fact that there hasn't been mass layoffs that's a real indicator of a recession yeah. and that just hasn't happened I know we had you know a, a bunch of tech layoffs earlier this year but in the grand scheme of things companies have been holding on to their workers, everyone's getting a paycheck, and people continue to spend. Yeah, super strong labor market. Also, unfortunately, though, we have seen this song and dance before. So the New York Times kind of pointed out all the previous times where 
soft landing became a really popular term and we yeah. might have jumped the gun a little bit. And that was before recessions in 1990, 2000, and even 2008. So we've done this before where a lot of people are saying, we're threading the needle, baby. Like we're soft landing. And then like things go haywire because a lot of people are saying that rate hikes are kind of like this a uh, long release medicine where you don't see the immediate effects right away. It's kind of like drawn out over time. So even though like we've kind of navigated this rate hike cycle much better than we anticipated, maybe a few months uh, right. or, or a few uh, weeks down the line, we're going to see right. a much different story. What that reminded me of is what happened with SVB. Because out of nowhere, this bank starts imploding and causes this cascade of problems across other banks. And that was because, I mean, obviously mismanagement, but the rate hikes kind of made a lot of their underlying assets underwater. Yeah. So uh, that's like one of the mechanisms by which rate hikes can kind of appear out of nowhere and cause a lot of economic mayhem. And who knows if, you know, there are other areas of the economy where higher interest rates might yeah. cause something to snap real quick. It's kind of like falling in love, Neil, where it happens slowly and then all at once. <laughs> but let's hope uh, <laughs> the, the, that actually predictions of a soft landing might come to pass. It would be maybe the second soft landing that the Fed has engineered. The most popularly cited one was in 1994 and 1995 under uh, former Fed chair Alan Greenspan, who successfully kind of jacked up rates to to around 6%, and the economy did not backslide into a recession, though it did cause the bankruptcy of Orange <laughs> County, California, which I didn't know went bankrupt. Neither did I. Let's party like it's 1994, I guess, Neil. All right, for our next story, Amazon is giving its grocery business a little makeover, and hopefully it's from someone other than our hair and makeup team. It's a two-part makeover, tackling both its online and brick-and-mortar presence. Amazon is known as the everything store, which has been a blessing and a curse for people who want to order groceries from them online. To help streamline, streamline things, Amazon is combining the shopping carts from Amazon Fresh, Amazon.com, and Whole Foods into one to eliminate some headaches. Plus, Amazon Fresh delivery will now be available for non-Prime members who don't want to pay that $150 yearly free. And in terms of brick and mortar, they're moving away from the tech-focused cashierless checkouts to add some more self-checkout lanes. Plus, how about this? They're adding Krispy Kreme donuts and coffee shops to the front of some Amazon Fresh stores to make them feel a little more homey and Gotta approachable. Gotta get back to the basics. Exactly. So major changes are going down the grocery aisle of Amazon, Neil. Do we think this is going to help them snag a bigger foothold in the giant $1.5 trillion grocery industry? It's just crazy because I remember in 2017 when Amazon bought Whole Foods for $13 billion. Uh, every other uh, grocery stock just absolutely plummeted. And you had everyone, every Anas was like, all right, well, this is the end of every other grocery store because Amazon is just at another level. It can bring all of this tech to bear. Uh, Whole Foods is a growing brand. And, you know, whenever Amazon goes into any industry, they just completely demolish everyone else. And it has not worked out for whatever reason. Maybe groceries are just grocery store is just like immune to tech disruption. And yeah. I guess my question is, like, do we need a higher tech grocery store experience or just did Amazon fail to execute on what its vision was? I think, yeah, I think its vision got a little bit fractured along the way because I just want to take you through what a potential grocery shopping experience would be like if you shop online at Amazon. So maybe you want some steak from dinner. You can order that from Whole Foods, but then maybe you want to pair it with some less expensive, less organic shredded lettuce. You could order that from Amazon Fresh. And if you wanted some normal brand, just Cheerios as a late night snack. Well, that comes from amazon.com. So by the end of the ordeal, you'd be checking out in three separate carts, receiving three separate deliveries. So again, that's why I was saying it was falling victim to it's labeled as the everything store where, yes, technically you get everything from it, but it was just a nightmare of a so process, confusing. which is why they're trying to condense it into one shopping cart, one checkout experience where you can do top and bottom all your groceries. So that's the online factor. But the brick and mortar factor is they have 44 Amazon Fresh stores, and I've never been in one. I've been to one. It's an interesting because their big thing, their big innovation was supposed to be like there's cameras everywhere. You just put it in your shopping cart and you walk out yeah. and it charges your Prime account. And yeah, it's like kind of cool. But the problem with these stores is that 
a lot of people have been complaining they're soulless. They are just like these concrete boxes. And I've been in one and yeah, they, it just, just doesn't have the right feel. So they're trying to add these Krispy Kreme donut shops to have right. that like nice smell of, of fresh donuts, fresh coffee, which again, it feels like not an important thing, but like you want to have that feel when you're shopping. Yeah, for you have a, yeah, you have a connection with your local grocery store. And I want to take us through the bit major grocery market right now. So who's the top dog is Walmart with 22% market share. Then you got Kroger at 10%, Costco, Albertsons and Amazon Whole Foods is down at number five with just 4.4% of the market. And then Publix. Let's go. Toby, <laughs> what's going on with Publix? It's Why regional. It's, it's not national. It's still kind of confined to the Southeast a little bit. But but I think it's it speaks to the loyalty that people right. have with their local supermarket. I mean, I'm, I'm going to shout out Big Y, <laughs> uh, Western Mass, Wilbraham, the pride of Wilbraham Mass, Big Y. But I don't know. Yeah, maybe you don't want a soulless experience. Yeah. Maybe you don't need a necessarily high-tech experience at your grocery store. I don't think getting like checked out at your grocery store is not necessarily a huge pain point that right, Amazon right. trying to yeah, solve. It's much better to have that like homey neighborhood feel. Or like, yeah, like you were saying earlier before the show, like the number one thing I care about in a grocery store is knowing where things are and being able to find them quickly. So it's that familiarity. Yeah, for sure. All right, Neil, uh, let's move on. When preparing last night for this next story, I felt a little distracted, a little unfocused. That's because there is a nationwide Adderall shortage that has been going on since at least last year. Labor shortages at Teva Pharmaceuticals, the largest producer of Adderall, has constrained supply, which has left millions of people with ADHD relying on the old-fashioned method of getting stuff done, procrastination and a little bit of tears. Both the FDA and the DEA have called on drug makers this week to work on boosting manufacturing of prescription stimulants to help alleviate these shortages. And they better figure it out fast because Adderall demand is off the charts. 11.3 million prescriptions were filled in Q3 last year, which was the highest ever. Part of the issue is that Adderall is a controlled substance so because people can get addicted and abuse it. So the DEA sets quotas that only allow companies to manufacture a certain amount each year. But companies have been complaining about those quotas. The DEA says, no, they're plenty high enough. It's become this big finger pointing mm -hmm. mess with people with ADHD kind of caught in the middle, Neil. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've heard stories of people here in New York City that have had to travel to Pennsylvania to fill their prescriptions. It's like been a severe shortage. And it reminds me of a plane delay because at first, it's, you know, it's 30 minutes to start and then it's an hour and then it's an hour and a half and then it's two hours. And you're like, well, I'm just going to be here all night, right? So because this thing, they first warned of, a, of an Adderall shortage down, uh, back in October 2022. Yeah. And what I don't, what is it, August, like nine months, nine, 10 months later, it's still going on. And I was just frankly, very surprised to see these headlines still happening. And there's a huge cascading effect across a bunch of the other Adderall uh competitors like mm -hmm. Vyvanse, Ritalin, Concerta, because everyone was shifting from Adderall because they couldn't get Adderall. They had yeah. to go get these competitor drugs. And then all of those drugs started uh, getting in short supply as well. So this is a very big issue for people who need these to kind of stay focused. And also it's treated for narcolepsy. Yeah, so. I didn't know that, by the way. Yeah, yeah we, I might need that too, because after the show in the morning, I, I always end up going to sleep. But yeah, drug shortages in general are at a nine year high with 309 medicines in short supply right now. Now. And a lot of it does come from a uh, domino effect, as you mentioned. So there's a sh uh, shortage of penicillin right now. And that started because uh, doctors started prescribing bicillin, which is a brand name for penicillin, for other things like strep throat. Um, and that was due to another shortage from amoxicillin, which is another antibiotic. So it's like this domino effect where like one drug gets short and then they start over prescribing another drug and then that drug gets short mm. and then they start over prescribing another drug so it really is like this delicate balance that if it gets <laughs> it's kind of like the planes yeah if it gets thrown out of whack then it all make that it all goes downhill it's a very delicate supply chain that relies a lot on uh, imported materials from abroad and it's just, yeah, it's very, very complex to make these medicines. And a lot, you know, there's only a few manufacturing plants that actually make a particular uh, 
th- uh, treatment. So if, you know, bad weather hits a particular right, plant right. or something goes awry with the manufacturing process or there's a labor shortage, which, w- which was in the case of Teva, mm-hmm. then there are huge effects across the spectrum because there are just not that many places that make that know how to make these yeah, particular it, medicines. You know what it also reminds me of is uh, the sriracha shortage that we talked about a few months ago where there's one place that produces the chilies that are used to make sriracha. Yeah. So it is, and if that's hit with drought or something, then you're totally right. It throws the whole supply chain out of whack. All right, before we jump into our next story, Neil, we're going to take a quick break. All right, welcome back to Neil's Numbers, the segment where I share three stats from the week's news that will make your brain melt into liquefied wisdom. Let's return to one of our subjects from yesterday's pod, Uber, because its CEO had a real Lucille Bluth, it's one banana, Michael, what could it cost? $10 moment? It happened when a Wired editor took a 2.95 mile Uber ride in New York City to meet CEO Dara Khosrowshahi. He asked the Uber boss to estimate how much his ride cost, and Uber CEO said 20 bucks. The real answer was $51.69, including a driver tip. The response from the CEO, oh my God, wow. Khosrow Shahi said it must be due to surge pricing, but the editor was like, it's 10 a.m. on a Sunday, Wednesday. It's not like the president's in town. So what does this episode show that uh, Uber CEO isn't, isn't exactly super in touch with how much rides cost here in New York City, but also just how much ride hailing prices have risen in recent years? The cost of rides for services like Uber and Lyft have essentially doubled from 2018 to 2021. And for Uber and Lyft in New York, they jumped 50 percent. Uh, I guess that's why Uber is profitable now. I know. It truly is. That's what I was thinking the whole time. It's like, it's not a coincidence that prices have doubled uh, over the last couple of years. And then Uber finally had its first profitable quarter. I mean, anyone who lives here knows, is like right. rolling its eyes at, at Uber CEO because like, yeah. I mean, we take an Uber into work every morning and it's 4 a.m. and it still is costing like 15 or 20 bucks. More than that for me. I know. So it is just ridiculous these days. But I guess if you want to be profitable, like get someone hooked on your on your product right. and, and then raise prices. Well, I remember the good old days when Uber and Lyft were fighting for market share and oh, I was yeah. getting those emails, you know, five, free, five free rides all the time. That was yeah. the millennial lifestyle subsidy of the, the boom years of 2017 and 2018. All right. Uh, for our second number, let's head to the NFL, which officially gets underway today. Well, pretty season anyway in the Hall of Fame game. In terms of storylines for this season, one thing stands out for us economics nerds, the collapse of the running back market. Running backs, who used to be highly coveted assets for teams, have essentially turned in, into commodities like soy, wheat, and corn. And because running backs have found to be largely interchangeable with one another, demand for an individual player's labor has completely plummeted, and so have their salaries. Here's a stat that highlights the running back recession. Together, just two quarterbacks, Justin Herbert and Lamar Jackson, will make more this season than every projected started starting NFL running back combined. It's crazy. It, it really is just such, it shows where the league was and where the league is going, which is just way more pass heavy. So you're, you're totally right. Like it doesn't value the services of a running back as much anymore. Right. And like the prices have, have reflected that. I feel so bad for running backs though, because it's the most physically grueling, physically demanding position and they get paid pennies on the dollar. Kickers, right. kickers are getting paid more on average than running backs. These Maybe days. they're more valuable. I know. Maybe the better ones, like it's all about your, your replacement value. Like how much are you better than right. your, your, competitor who you could sign i could just sign a younger running back for cheaper uh and not really lose any of my competitive edge as a football team but then we know that markets have have uh, you know have been known to correct themselves yeah so like what's the next step here are is the running back market going to come online is the you know the nature of the nfl play making going to change yeah, so that's what they need i think i think the market will rebound in some fashion but it will be really interesting to see all right final number uh, there's a new paper out from sam peltzman at the university of chicago that examines what makes us happy and in surveys through 2018 he found one thing by far is most influential in separating the happy from the unhappy in america i'll give our listeners a couple seconds to think about this and you can also just pause the tape for however long you'd like and think well the answer is marriage people who are married are at least 30 points happier than unmarried people happiness in general in the u.s has declined significantly over the past few decades and peltzman says that fewer people getting married is a major contributor to that decline 
It's so interesting, but I guess it is just better to navigate life with someone. We were, we were kind of joking before the show. Like we know some like married couples and you're like, those are the happiest people in, in America. Like that's kind of crazy. How, what are the rest of us doing? But yeah, I, I did love seeing like that. That's the biggest Delta between happy and non-happy people. Some, some, some of the commentary on this, partner. some of the commentary on this was, are, does marriage make you happy or are happier people most likely to get married because sad people, no one wants to be with them. <laughs> that's so, it's, so it's, it's a correlation so causation yeah, yeah. situation. That's very but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can't hurt. It sounds like that if you <laughs> want to put a hurt. ring on it. All right, Neil, thank you for those wonderful numbers as always. But I actually have a number of my own that I want to talk about for our next story. And that is 26.1 billion. That's the estimated value of the global sports memorabilia market as of 2021. That number comes from the consulting group Market Decipher and was in an article we stumbled across yesterday in a publication called The Rob Report, which went super deep on the ins and outs of the memorabilia market. It is nuts, Neil. We're talking a game-worn Maradona jersey selling for $9.3 million, Jordan's flu game sneakers selling for $1.4 million, and even a Derek Jeter-signed Yankees stadium seat for almost $2,000. This report was packed with so many anecdotes and weird facts about the sheer size and craziness of the sports memorabilia market. What stood out to you in particular? What stood out to me is that there are two very different categories of collectors here. You have to go after, there's one category, which is autograph cards and tickets, and the other is used clothing and equipment. And what gives each of those categories value is so, and status is so different. So for the cards and tickets, it has to be super pristine, mint condition, never been touched, n no bends or folds. And then for the used clothing or equipment, it's how dirty can I make this? Or I, I can't touch this up at all from its original. Yeah. More blood, the better. More sweat, the better. So the fact that though there are these two mo super popular categories with, with such different markers of value was yeah. really interesting to me. I thought that was very interesting as well. What stood out to me is actually they were looking at where's the growth opportunities in sports uh, collection right now. And a lot of people said it's in the women's game because there's basically a non-existent like yeah. sports collectible market for women's sports. And so there's actually scarcity there, whereas all these other markets are a little more saturated and becoming even more saturated. So like, yeah, maybe like it's an Alex Morgan signed jersey or a, a game worn jersey or something like that. Because yeah, right now the market is 99%. <laughs> the collectible That's market is 99% male, which is just wild because a lot of people just like gravitate hate towards this if, if you're a guy but so a lot of analysts were saying like all right listen the women's market is where like the untapped the the real growth is is lying this is an industry in hyper growth mode and it's one that started that really picked up during covid and hasn't let up even if people are can leave their house now the the same report predicted that the size of the sports memorabilia industry will reach 227 billion by 2032 that right, and what is it now? It says it's 20, 26 billion now. So that's 10xing, yeah. Which that's is, 10xing over 10 years, which I don't. I, I mean, I guess it's possible, but <laughs> I don't know how they arrived at that number. We, we need the women to win the World Cup again, so yeah. Alex Morgan jersey just becomes a million dollars. All right, uh, I want to wrap up today with a little lost and found. Earlier this week, NASA heard a sound known as a heartbeat signal from Voyager 2 that it had lost contact with two weeks ago, indicating that the 46-year-old spacecraft is alive and well. Look, I don't blame NASA for losing this thing at all. It's traveling in deep space 12.3 billion miles from Earth, dodging stars at a velocity of 34,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, I've gone through 12 pairs of earbuds in the last three months. Still, how it lost contact is a little uh, embarrassing. Some intern, JK was probably not an intern, uh, gave a wrong command that tilted Voyager 2's antenna just two degrees off kilter, which was enough to sever contact with ground control. But now that NASA knows that Voyager 2 is still out there somewhere, it's going to try to send it a command that gets its antenna pointed back in the right direction. This made me so sad for some reason. Whenever I think about like Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 all the way out in space, just like hurtling through the darkness, and then to to think that we lost contact with it, it literally made me like emotional because like these things have been just plugging along for so many years and like I don't want them just to be out there by themselves. I don't know if anyone feels that sort of kinship towards a, a space 
craft, but I certainly I think did. everyone was just beating up on this command <laughs> thing, but I don't blame them. This is this is uh, literally rocket science. <laughs> I know. But m what I was thinking about was they. I didn't realize they launched Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 at the same time in 1977. So I don't know who got Voyager 1 and who got Voyager 2. Yeah, that is interesting. Voyager 1 is further away. It's 15 billion. Yeah. But if they launch them at the same time, it's like how do, who, I feel like Voyager 2 is a little and, and Voyager got a chip on his shoulder. It's a, it's a bit of a, more of a problem child too. Voyager 1, like they've, knew it. they've kept uh, contact with and like hasn't been a problem. But Voyager 2, they've started to shut down some instruments, conserve a little power to extend their mission. So yeah, there's always, there's always a problem child in any, in any duo. <laughs> Apparently it's carrying stuff on board in case uh, aliens intercept it. It's got a message in a bottle. It's got a track of natural sounds from Earth. Yeah. It's got saying hello in 55 different languages. Which is crazy because aliens are already here, right? So but why, why do we even <laughs> need them uh, to, to find but, a, a space shuttle? So apparently it only has three years left to live anyway. Like all of it's, it's just going to shut down. But I say it should. Uh, it should try to get married so those last three years are a little happier. I was going to say it just crash landed to Pluto. Go out in a <laughs> blaze of glory. There you go. Uh, let's wrap it up there. Hope everyone has a wonderful Thursday. If you want to write in and let us know your favorite grocery store, your favorite local grocery store, our email is morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com, especially if it's Big Y. Uh, Emily Milliron is our editor and producer. Samantha Velas and Raymond Liu are our associate producers. Yuchenna Waogu is our technical director. Billy Menino is on audio. We have lost all contact with hair and makeup. Devin Emery is our chief content officer and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow.